Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our 25th iGeriCare live event. Uh, today's topic is on frailty and dementia, and we are absolutely delighted to have my friend and co-founder of iGeriCare, geriatrician Dr. Richard Strampko from McMaster University. Hi, everybody. How are you feeling? How how are things going in, in our our 25th live event, and I don't know how many ones within the pandemic, but I hope you oh. and your family are keeping well. So. Thanks. Yeah, we're doing well. Thanks so much for asking. Hope you are too, and your family also. Thank you. So, you know, frailty is a, uh, a very challenging topic. I think there are a lot of people, it, it's almost like the label or it has a connotation of feeling a bit embarrassing or shameful. It, it, it does have a little bit of a, a negative meaning if people talk about, oh, this, you know, this person's frail. But it, it's, it's a somewhat more recent concept, isn't it? The whole notion of frailty. And it seems kind of uh, mixed up or mixed together a bit with uh, getting old or, or aging. But they're they're quite different. So why don't we start off with just some basics? What 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 is actually meant by frailty exactly? Yeah, I, it's kind of one of those things where it's like you know it when you see it, um, but the researchers and scientists have been evolving the language around frailty and a lot of the ways in which you might be able to measure and identify it. And it's kind of one of those composite things where a lot of different factors play into it. So. Um, it describes a state of being vulnerable to life stressors. So I kind of have an analogy. It's not the best analogy in the world, and I'm not a, a frailty expert researcher, but, you know, occasionally storms come through town and storms definitely come through our lives. Uh, they're more likely to come through our lives as we get older. And if you had a fence that was around for a period of time, but has fallen into a state of disrepair, maybe some of the boards are missing the supporting structures aren't quite there. Maybe some of the wood is rotted a little bit and you have a tornado or a hurricane or very strong winds come through town. It's going to be able to blow that fence over quite easily. Whereas if you had a new strongly reinforced structure with steel beams and brand new wood, when that storm comes through, you're able to weather the storm. And similarly, as people get older, they can uh, accumulate deficits and become a little bit more weak so that when they go into, let's say, hospital, and they get admitted for a pneumonia. If their muscles aren't working as well as they should, and they're weak, and they've lost some mass over time, and perhaps their nutrition's not as good as it has been in the past, um, they're feeling exhausted and tired and fatigued. Perhaps as, well, perhaps as well, their cognition is not what it used to be. All of those things work together to make that person more vulnerable to an admission to hospital where they're unable to walk around the wards like they used to. And so they can go downhill quite quickly. And similarly, if let's say you or I went through an operation and we had to have some sort of hip replaced, generally we'd expect to sail through without any problems. Whereas when you've reached that frail state where again, your muscles are a little bit weaker, your nutritional status is compromised, perhaps your memory and thinking isn't quite where it used to be then um, you're more likely to have some adverse events take place. So, so yeah, when we, I guess, uh, when we think about how the word is often used in sort of normal language, it's sort of, oh, if something is frail, it's weak. But I, I think what you're saying is it's, it's kind of a composite. There's sort of like several factors. Most of them are physical, but they, they kind of involve your muscle strength or a sense of feeling uh, fatigued or your ability to kind of respond to some type of illness or adversity and all of these different things together kind of form uh, uh, this concept of, of frailty. It's not just, you know, having weak muscles or, or being tired, but it's kind of a combination of those things. And we'll get to it a bit later, but when one sets in, it tends to impact all of the other um, subdomains that we've been talking about. And, you know, once you start feeling tired or feeling fatigued or not eating or drinking as much, you tend to stop moving as much and you become deconditioned. So you become even more weak. And 
just something to mention is that it's not a part of normal aging. So I have patients that come through that are quite physically robust and don't have the issues that we've talked about. They might have some memory and thinking problems and that's it. And they might be mild memory and thinking problems and maybe some high blood pressure. Um, and they look much different when they go through something like an operation or a hospitalization than the patient that has the attributes we just discussed. And so I think it's really important to point that out, that normal aging is not associated with becoming frail. And there are interventions and things we can all do to avoid from becoming frail. And, and what is the, the linkage exactly between dementia and frailty? It's kind of, a, it looks like it's a two-way street um, in that when you look at people that have Alzheimer's disease and you look at their brains and you subclassify frail people versus non-frail people, the people that are frail see, seem to have worse pathology or accumulation of these toxic proteins within their brain. So it looks like in one direction, if you're frail, you're going to have worse cognitive impairment or potentially it might progress faster than it could otherwise. In the opposite direction, no, in that as you uh, progress with a neurodegenerative disease and your brain's not functioning the same way it used to, then you tend to stop moving the way you did. Your muscles tend to get weaker. You stop eating and drinking as much. Um, and so in the opposite direction, as your dementia progresses, you frequently become more frail. So there's a, it's a two way street. Okay. And, um, maybe just what would be the most common features of frailty? What would, what would, you know, somebody at home, if they were wondering if they themselves have frailty or if they're wondering the, the person they care for, what would it, what would it look like? What are the features that they would see? Um, so I think there's kind of two ways of looking at frailty. One is like a, a phenotypic or a, a classic story of what somebody might look like. And the other one would be a research accumulation of deficits. So the more story uh, or narrative based phenotype would most cl common features are um, unintentional weight loss, uh, usually more than 10 pounds within a year, 5% of body mass feeling fatigued, a loss of strength, or feeling like your muscles are weak, slower walking speed, and lower levels of physical activity. Um, and that's a particular model usually described as the Freed model, which describes it like that. Not included in that would be more the nutritional side of things okay. as well. The accumulation of um, a lot of different medical conditions, because you know, the more medical conditions that somebody has, the more medications they're on, the more likely they are to get medication side effects. And even those can make people feel weak and tired. Um, so that's important. And the, the nutritional side of things as well. So you kind of picture that older adult that might not be walking so fast. They might be walking with a four wheeled walker. They could have experienced falls quite frequently. That's a manifestation of frailty. You might see their memory and thinking not being quite as sharp. And when they're coming into clinic or you're in their house, they've got a blister pack with a whole bunch of medications in it uh, and probably a lot of kind of other pills and vitamins as, as well. So the, the five common features, just to kind of go back over sort of uh, the features that are often part of the frailty story, unintentional weight loss, fatigue, a loss of strength or muscle weakness, um, slowed down walking speed, and low levels of physical activity. Those would be sort of things. And, and I guess what you're saying is the the story often also includes things like having multiple medical conditions and, and maybe like uh, you, you almost described it as a bit of a vicious cycle that you might you know, develop more weakness and then have a fall. And then as you're recovering, you might be less active so that it, it all, it all sort of leads to more and more weakness, I guess, overall. Absolutely. And I don't want to get too much into it from the research side of things. So this is one particular model. That's the most commonly cited, this kind of free model of, of frailty. And it makes sense. And it's very useful for helping to describe it. 
when you include some other features of something else called the frailty index, then that includes more of the medical problems that people have, the malnutrition they have, not being able to complete their functional activities at home. We've talked about activities of daily living. So getting in and out of bed, bathing themselves, getting dressed, eating, getting to the bathroom, they might start to find those day-to-day -day functional activities a lot more challenging because they feel weak and fatigued. Um, and then certainly the higher order stuff as well. But you, you can see it manifest in a, in a lot of different ways. But when you focus on those first five plus worsening medical conditions, memory and thinking, nutrition, um, and poor functional uh, performance, you're kind of getting a, a better picture of everything. We, we were talking about some of those associated risks and I guess the linkages between different factors. Maybe maybe comment a little bit on, on this, uh, this slide um, that is I guess includes some of the things that you spoke about the 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 weight loss, the unintentional weight loss, but you also mentioned nutrition, and then it has like the decreased physical activity and that sense of reduced uh, muscle mass or weakness and decreased walking speed, and then and then the the functional implications for it. I guess as you said, that it might lead to other issues. Yeah, and I think it's worthwhile, you know, to just pick out a more specific example. So for, for instance, if, if somebody um, gets depressed, for instance, something's happened in their life, there's been a major change in the place where they live, they've had to relocate from their lifelong house to a retirement home or nursing home, and they get depressed, oftentimes people will have a depressed appetite and will stop eating and mm. drinking as much. When they stop eating and drinking as much, you start to feel a little bit weak and a little bit tired. And you tend not to move. Your muscles always need protein to regenerate and need caloric intake to be strong. And so your muscle strength might get reduced. When your muscle strength gets reduced, your walking speed might uh, get reduced. And you're also more prone to having impaired balance. So you've reached that frail state. And now you've reached that frail state, your balance is impaired and you might start falling. If somebody falls and let's say fractures their hip, then they have pain and they've undergone an operation. They might've had some confusion or delirium in hospital. And then it takes them so much longer to get back to where they were, or they might not ever regain that functional status again, which results in their lack of functional dependence. So you've got a whole web of things interacting, which is quite hard to tease out, which is why the uh, frailty in totality is a valuable term. You're kind of describing a composite measure of all of these different variables that can interact. And on a patient by patient basis, you kind of come up with the map of the variables that are interacting. And then on a one by one basis, you intervene. So for instance, if this person that had depression, if you intervened early enough, let's say, and they had appropriate cognitive behavioral therapy and perhaps some pharmacologic management or medications, you might've stopped the depression. Their appetite would have been okay. Uh, you could have prevented their reduced muscle um, mass and reduced strength and their walking speed might have been maintained. So, you know, it's, it's really important um, to figure out precisely what the mechanisms of frailty are in your individual patient, because that's the level of intervention. But I guess because there's potentially quite a few things going on, it might also mean that there's quite a few things that people might be able to do to, to address it. As you said, in, in that example, if you, if you feel like the primary cause might be something like a depression, that might be the most important area to intervene. But in the meantime, there could still be other ways that you try to help the person to stay active or uh, increase their nutrition or, or other, other I guess, things that people could do at home, even, even as, you know, you, you, you might want to get to sort of the, the main cause. Absolutely. And um, because there's so many things going on with frailty, there's always more than one thing happening uh, or usually more than one thing happening most frequently. And so you're going to be intervening on, on different levels to address their state of frailty. So as you said, prescribing exercise there's probably more evidence for exercise and improving people's frailty scores and maintaining independence than anything else. You know, exercise improves your cognitive function, 
uh, improves your sense of well-being and mood, makes people more mobile, decreases their risk of falling, maintains their bone mineral density so that they're going to have a decreased risk of fracturing um, their hip or their uh, spine if they have a fall. Um, and so you definitely want usually exercise in most of these prescriptions. Um, if the medications are causing problems we described, you might want to decrease some medications if they're causing side effects. You may want to um, get people on a better nutritional program. I think that's one of the most gratifying things and why I love geriatrics so much is, you know, a lot of different specialties in medicine will get excited about prescribing a medication. Well, I get prescribed, I get excited about altering people's nutritional habits and increasing their caloric intake and providing them with supplements like Boost or Onsure. And it's, it's really remarkable to see how people can get going down the wrong path, but when you can get their weight up and energy levels up, it's transformational. I've seen kind of older, more frail people put on, you know, eight to 15 pounds, depending on what happens. And they look completely different when you see them in follow-up. Maybe it's worth actually talking about uh, this uh, from the Canadian Frailty Network, this uh, acronym of uh, avoid frailty as some of the things that uh, can be done to lower the risks. And why don't why don't we do a bit of a, a deep dive of each one? You've mentioned a few of them, but um, what what can you say about each one of these uh, components, I guess? So activity is great when we kind of touched on that a, a briefly. Multiple forms of physical activity are uh, encouraged. So whether it's resistance training, more um, uh, endurance training, or, um, or cardio balance exercises are also good. Things like Tai Chi, there's the strengthening component, but then there's also maintaining your uh, functional movement ability, which is more in the the balance side of things. So those are really important. And I think that the 24 hour movement guidelines that have recently come out emphasize not just the exercise side, but trying to decrease sedentary activity and get, get a good night's sleep. So those are things that are sort of the flip side of, <laughs> of the physical activity and exercise piece as well. Absolutely. Instead of sitting down and watching TV for four or five hours at a time, take breaks, get up, start moving around uh, in between. But the, do take do take 45 minutes to watch uh, this uh, yes. uh, live event, you know, but after that, Absolutely. Uh, after that, get up and, and move around a little World's bit. World's your oyster after this. <laughs> That's right. Um, um, yeah, vaccinate, obviously a, a hot topic uh, during the coronavirus pandemic, but I, I think this is referring to other types of vaccinations uh, as well, right? Absolutely. Um, so uh, the flu vaccine is obviously important. Uh, no, it's not as prevalent now because of all of our physical distancing and public health measures in place, but certainly the flu in a regular year causes a lot of problems. So if you're above um, 65, you should get that annually, as well as uh, shingles and pneumonia vaccine. So there's several various uh, pneumonia vaccines that people um, can get. Um, you know, and I think it's one of those things too, is people don't realize how much shingles can impact someone. So there's mm -hmm. the, the initial, um, illness where you'll get a skin rash and, um, some blisters and that'll happen kind of at various points along the skin, but a lot of people will develop a chronic pain syndrome called post-herpetic neuralgia, and it can be quite debilitating for people. And if you have that, and oftentimes people are on pain medications and that can cause side effects. So that's important. And the, the pneumococcal vaccines that are out do substantially reduce people's risk of uh, hospitalization and more severe pneumonias if you are to get a pneumonia. So that's very helpful in that regard. And even more so when you're frail, as we said, it's right. a vulnerable state. So if you're going to go to hospital, it could really set you back. Whereas if you can avoid that hospitalization, um, you're less likely to have a bad outcome. And, and you mentioned a couple of times that notion of um, the medications and the role they might play and whether the person's on multiple medications, that, but that concept of optimize that we sometimes use is sort of 
the right number of medications for the right patient and conditions and and kind of reevaluating it. Because I think what we see, uh, certainly you and I, when we're consulting in the hospital is people get put on medications sometimes and they never get reevaluated. And so they may have been on something for years without it even necessarily being that helpful. So optimizing meds doesn't necessarily mean de-prescribing or stopping all of them, but it does mean taking a, a comprehensive look and coming up with a kind of rational approach to which medicines somebody needs and making sure they're not on too many or that the side effects aren't interfering with their function. Absolutely. Um, what about the interact one? I think that's one that's become of more interest uh, during the pandemic when more people have been, um, you know, physical distancing, but also social distancing. And there's been a lot more concern, I think, about social isolation. Is that something that that is, uh, um, is it something that people can do stuff about, I guess? Definitely. In normal times, we would um, be able to have people go to day programs where they'll get out of their house and darts might pick them up or their family members might pick them up and take them to a community center or sometimes a retirement home and people could do exercises together they would get a meal together there were social activities so it really helps to stimulate the brain from just basic cognitive function in terms of your memory and thinking and how you interact but also that human touch element and uh, maintaining social connectivity is such a big part of maintaining your well-being as a human generally, right? We're built to be social social beings. And um, certainly it has a big impact on your overall cognitive function, but also that um, set general sense of well-being and your physical well-being. Now in the times of COVID, we're, we're still really recommending that, you know, families are involved. And um, if you're trying to limit contact, then that would be over the phone or via some sort of video conferencing app but still trying to maintain those social connections uh, at any cost because they're so um, important. Um, you know, I think we've talked many times about loneliness and social isolation worsening people's health outcomes. Um, so it certainly can, can lead to worsening cognitive problems and, and physiological mm -hmm. aging. And I don't like, I haven't seen um, a lot of science about this, but there's so many people that I've seen that have had new onset cognitive problems since the onset of the pandemic. Like I've never had so many people come in through the clinic that have said, you know, very clearly, well, when did your memory and thinking problems start? And it's like, well, it started in April or March of 2020. Um, so it's been very disconcerting and it's not like a depression thing either where, um, you know, you're socially isolated, you're depressed and depression is causing your cognitive impairment. It's that lack of interaction and social mm -hmm. engagement. So I really strongly encourage everybody to, you know, maintain those, those connections at all costs. The final D you, you did mention uh, around diet and nutrition, and you talked about the potential role for you know, prescribing maybe uh, high protein dietary supplements. Um, what what else can you say about it? I guess there's there's certain um, certain things that we do see in in practice though, where people have less interest in eating, even if they're not necessarily depressed, but they they may be um, without even thinking about it. They're really reducing their their number of calories, and and your your body does need a certain number of calories to sort of sustain its energy level. Is that, is that something that you, you see quite, quite a lot in your practice? Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the big issues to address here is the social determinants of health too. And sometimes people can't afford to get the food into their house. Sometimes it might be a memory problem and they're not um, able to remember to get the food. Sometimes it's an organizational thing and they don't know how to buy appropriate amounts of groceries. So I think that's the one thing to realize about diet and nutrition is that it's not just always about eating. Sometimes it's access and disparities between populations and inequities within our society. So that's the first thing. Yeah. The second thing is um, sometimes people, you're right, they just don't feel like eating or 
they got quite, quite often constipated. So they have early fullness after eating, but constipation is so prevalent that sometimes all you have to do is treat the constipation. They feel like they can eat more um, and it gets better. So that's very important mm. as well. Um, there, go ahead. No, no, keep going. There are um, easy to access supplements like Boost or Onshore, which you know may have 250 to 300 calories. So if they are starting to eat and you know three times a day they're getting reasonable meals, you can give people those supplements in between meals if they can tolerate the volume. And then there's something else called 2Cal, which is really high density, low volume supplement that you only need about 50 or 60 milliliters. And you can take that three or four times a day and really um, that helps out. Um, yeah, that's, that quite sounds quite interesting because I think a lot of people who who are maybe um, they're not excited about taking in more stuff orally, they often either complain about the taste of some of the protein supplements or the volume. They just feel like it's it's too too much for them to to drink. So, uh, but I, I, I was going to say too, I think one of the other things we do sometimes see is that the the foods that people are getting are maybe not super high nutritionally so that they may be getting, you know, some form of calories. It might still be low, but they're not necessarily getting a lot of uh, high protein in, in those foods. They may be more uh, like high carbohydrate or a lot of, you know, sort of the tea and toast type of uh, um, story that we hear, I think is often quite true that people are uh, reaching for, you know, bread and toast and may or may not have a high protein thing added to that, that meal. But. Yeah, the, the, the final thing that I'll say, this is kind of the fun part about it is um, you have to think about medical comorbidities. So if somebody has heart failure, for instance, or kidney problems, you don't want to load them up with sodium. But if you don't have heart failure and kidney problems, and there's really tasty foods that people might have been avoiding for a long period of time, then you can liberalize their diets as well. So, you know, if you don't have diabetes, you know, and you really want to put on some weight, then it's like, hey, eat as many chocolate bars as you want, or <laughs> eat, eat lots of milkshakes. And, you know, there's actually a fair amount of protein and sugar and calories and things like milkshakes. So you can kind of personalize it as well, as long as the medical issues they're struggling with through medications don't interfere. Um, and sometimes that's kind of fun too, because it's more about um, promoting quality of life immediately, as opposed to avoiding diabetes in 20 years from now. You're going to, I can see you're going to be the very popular, uh, cool geriatrician now. And people will be like, well, but Dr. Dr. Stramko said I could have the all chocolate bar diet and, uh, and you'll be <laughs> yeah. in trouble. Yeah. Let's let's go for some uh, some questions and comments from uh, folks that have come in, and then we'll we'll maybe circle back just to kind of reinforce uh, some of the key the key learnings around how to reduce the risk of frailty. So here was a comment that says, uh, "My my mother eats a lot, but is down fifty pounds." Any comments around that? Is that a scenario you see where people are eating, but but still losing weight and, and presumably muscle mass. Yeah. There's always, um, there's, there's the unintentional weight loss paradigm. And the, the first thing you always address is like, what is the caloric intake? But if somebody's eating a substantial amount of food and has appropriate calories and protein and carbohydrates, then I always look for an alternative cause. And sometimes people might have a chronic infection or sometimes people might have a cancer. So, Anytime there's unintentional weight loss where people are eating and consuming as much food as they should be consuming, then you have to think that their metabolic needs are somehow outpacing or higher than what they would normally be. And so I always go looking for a, a physiologic or pathologic cause of that weight loss before I just say, hey, let's go and, you know, liberalize your um, okay. intake. So that would be one well, that's to, concerning to me. Right yeah. So it'd be, con it is concerning and it, it also requires one, you know, actually making, keeping track closely of what the intake is to make sure that the intake is meeting their needs, but also looking for other potential causes that might be affecting their, their metabolism and the weight loss. So. And that's part of this comprehensive assessment act as a geriatrician where we're asking you all about your heart symptoms and lung symptoms and stomach symptoms and skin symptoms and 
nerve symptoms and psychiatric symptoms. Like yeah. we'll go through and we'll ask you every single possible thing that you could potentially be struggling with, you know, do some blood work to make sure there's nothing there in the obvious potentially do some imaging, like some CT scans or an ultrasound or something, just to make sure that there's nothing that's there, making sure people are up to date on their, their cancer screening and whatnot as well. So here's another comment uh, asking about the relationship between COVID and isolation. And how would you say this is affecting mental and physical frailty from what you've seen? Yeah, it's, it's really been terrible. Um, but I am, I would love to give a, a shout out to all of the personal support workers that are getting in there and the physiotherapists and occupational therapists that are seeing people in their homes. There's been a huge push to come up with these mobile frailty programs where people are, are getting provided exercises or being sent videos so they can maintain exercises. Um, and all of the family members are, are, as well that are keeping people up and going. So it's, um, it's definitely impacted people in a negative way, um, but I'm, I'm still blown away and hopeful based on the response by friends and family and other informal caregivers, as well as the formal healthcare teams. Like it's really been remarkable to see um, how people have been maintained despite having significant amounts of frailty. I'm, I'm constantly blown away by it. I, I was um, just prior, I had to leave the, the webinar prior to, to our live event today, but I was watching a presentation from Dr. Parminder Rayner from Raina from uh, McMaster, who is uh, heads up the, the Canadian longitudinal study on aging. And it was a presentation looking at uh, rates of depression during the pandemic because they had baseline data and there was definitely an increase in uh, depressive symptoms uh, as part of the pandemic in older adults. It wasn't equally distributed. So to your comment about social determinants of health as well, there are populations that at, at baseline were at higher risk and uh, certain genders at higher risk. But I, I think uh, just to echo your point, I think the, the isolation has not been uh, good for either uh, mental well-being and it's contributed to loneliness and 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 social isolation and i'm sure it's also contributed to physical frailty just because many people have reduced their physical activity they're going out less and so many of those factors i think have compounded it despite many people's best efforts and again i think many family members have tried their best to ensure that Oh, you know, their their older adults or family members with dementia have as much stimulation as possible, but it's been very challenging. Um, do people with dementia get depressed when they don't remember you or what has been said? Sometimes I just get a blank stare. Um, <clears throat> yes, that can definitely happen. I think one is that sometimes before people get dementia, there's a programmal state where the damage that's being done to the brain impacts the centers that are responsible for mood. And you can explain this far better than I. So some people will get depressed in advance of having their memory and thinking problems, and it will continue on into the time where they start having more severe memory and thinking problems. There are people that don't have any insight, uh, meaning they don't understand that they have memory and thinking problems. And so they don't understand why people are um, looking at them differently or interacting with them differently. They get really frustrated that they can't do things independently because they don't know according to the way they see the world. Um, they should be able to do everything that they did. You know, they can't drive anymore. And so they start to see themselves as slightly different. And then yes, in the, the situation where somebody does understand that they're having memory and thinking problems and are aware of it and have to deal with kind of the suffering of being aware with it aware of what's taking place, it can definitely, definitely cause it. The, the blank stare, that's hard to kind of put in perfect context. Sometimes people are a little bit flat or uh, less emotionally responsive um, as a result of their neurodegenerative problem. And so sometimes the lack of reactivity or just being a bit flat, uh, sometimes people are apathetic 
um, that's not necessarily being depressed and having those bad symptoms of being sad or feeling low or sleeping too much or sleeping too little or not eating enough or eating too much. Like there's not those associated problems. So, yeah, I, I would, I would agree with you that, you know, they, the answer is somewhat nuanced because it, it, it does depend on the person and the circumstance, but I would say in most cases, it uh, depends on how much awareness the person has of the deficits. And then if even if they are aware, not everybody gets overly upset or depressed about that, uh, They, depending on their other circumstances and their temperament and maybe prior history of depression. But I would say in the case that's described here, and I guess we're we're sort of interpreting a little bit based on if somebody doesn't seem to recognize you and can't remember exactly what was said, and they're just sort of staring back at you, I would say they're probably not necessarily insightful if they have more a moderate to severe dementia and they're not necessarily aware that they're not recognizing or not knowing, I would say it's probably less likely that they're going to experience sadness as a result of that. Whereas very early on in early stage dementia, or maybe as you say, before somebody is even diagnosed, there may be a, a higher chance of uh, frustration or sadness at when, when there's awareness of some of the the cognitive deficits or not remembering names or, or events. But uh, so probably not, but again, it's uh, important to look at whether there are other signs and symptoms that also suggest that somebody is uh, having, a, having a depression. Here's a, a, a comment. My mom's lost all strength and has a lot of pain in her legs and nothing has helped so far. I'm really worried about a fall. What can I do? Yeah, the the pain issue is is definitely a huge one because if you if moving causes you pain, you avoid moving. When you avoid moving, then you start to move less and you become deconditioned. And when you become deconditioned, your muscles become are, are weak, and so you move even less. And it's just that vicious cycle that um, that kind of moves further. So addressing the pain is always you know what is causing the pain, you know where. Um, uh, so where is the cause of the pain? So sometimes people might have ankle pain or knee pain or hip pain from osteoarthritis or various causes. Sometimes they can have an inflammatory arthritis, but other times too, very commonly people will have degenerative disc disease or uh, degenerative bone disease in the spine where the spinal canal can narrow and it can press on the spinal cord, press on nerves. And there's little holes that come out the side where the nerves travel from your spinal cord out. There could be compression there as well. And so frequently when there's compression of the nerves of the spinal cord, there will be pain radiating down into the legs. There can be more sinister or severe causes of that as well. So it's very important to diagnose you know, what the problem is, where precisely the problem is, make sure it's nothing sinister, and then being on appropriate pain management. So if it's more knee joint pain, you know, regular Tylenol or anti-inflammatory cream like um, Voltaren is good and sometimes low dose uh, uh, of other more powerful medications. But if it's nerve pain, then there are um, certain antidepressants or specific nerve pain agents like pregabalin that can be used. So it's gotta be a specific diagnosis if she hasn't seen anybody. And again, this is not perfect medical advice, but always see your doctor and get assessed for any of the symptoms uh, in your life that are causing significant um, uh, pain or, or dysfunction. The other, the other challenge that I, I think um, we sometimes see as well, if somebody has been inactive for a while, they may develop more anxiety about uh, falling. So that can sometimes, uh, again, also be a bit of a vicious cycle where they may start to inhibit movement and also, uh, you know, become more fixated on the pain and that they, they reduce their walking and then they lose a lot of their confidence in addition to being deconditioned and, and rightly maybe 
more afraid of falling because they actually have become uh, weaker. So that there, it's really important in addition to trying to understand the origin of the pain and looking at uh, pharmacologic, uh, you know, things that could be helpful tools in the toolbox, really, really important to um, explore non drug approaches as well to get people back into the habit of moving. Uh, there might be physiotherapy kinds of exercises. Physiotherapy is unfortunately not always widely available, uh, but the, you know, getting, getting activity and advice from physiotherapists and occupational therapists can be really important to, uh, to build up people's ability to be more active again. The, the thing that uh, got, the, there was a follow up about what are the sinister causes, and I think you touched on a few, but I think you were referring to the, the chance that somebody might have a cancer, for example, that could be making them weak. And but also if a cancer had spread to some of the bones in the spine, it might be impinging or pushing against a nerve and causing pain. Uh, so the, and, and then other like not we, we usually think of sinister being, you know, more permanent or, or worrisome things like a cancer, but sometimes there could be problems with the blood supply to the legs, uh, causing, uh, pain symptoms. And while, while that may also be, uh, you know, there are treatments for that, uh, that can also be a, a challenging one sometimes to diagnose. Um, final question before we we uh, wrap up, what kind of exercise routine should a person with osteoporosis and osteoarthritis do to avoid frailty? There's some really good resources, exercise resources actually on the Osteoporosis Canada website. So I would really recommend those. They have actually quite a few really nice exercise routines. And um, similarly, actually, the Arthritis, uh, Arthritis Canada website also has uh, great resources. Uh, we, we have a, a, an e-learning module as well, actually, on our McMaster Optimal Aging website, uh, mcmasteroptimalaging.org, uh, on uh, osteoarthritis and exercise. So that might be worth checking out, but I, I would really recommend the Osteoporosis Canada and arthritis.ca uh, websites for advice around specific exercises for, uh, for people with, uh, with those conditions. Anything you wanted to add to that, uh, Richard? No, I think that's great. Uh, well, actually one thing I would just say is getting a catered um, exercise program from a physiotherapist, if at all possible, like I go see physiotherapists and um, I work with physiotherapists. I think sometimes they're an underutilized resource because they can personalize it. So, you know, as, uh, as you were saying, if you have osteoporosis and you've had compression fractures, you might need some modified exercises or if you have hip pain or other medical limitations. So it's always good to see an exercise prescription professional. So a, a physiotherapist or a kinesiologist and, even occupational therapists can yeah. help sometimes. Yeah. And, and they have, you know, there are some stuff on, on the uh, osteoporosis uh, Canada one where they have uh, chair exercises, for example, things you can do in the home. And, uh, you know, depending on resources uh, and physical activity, there may be other, uh, other options. Uh, walking is often an excellent exercise, but people may need to build up uh, some of their strength. So I agree with it's We're, Unfortunately, we don't always have widespread access to rehabilitation professionals like physiotherapists and occupational therapists, and um, many of them aren't covered by mo many of the provincial formularies, so can be a challenge. Uh, chair stands is one thing that I didn't mention, which is actually used quite frequently to diagnose frailty. So being able to get up out of a chair without using your arms like just having your arms folded across your chest and being able to stand five times is actually a fairly good measure of frailty, but also performing chair stands, as you're saying, you know, just referring to the chair, um, can be quite a good exercise for strengthening your quads, and your, your core strength. And it's a very functional movement because we all need to get out of chairs day to day. Yeah. 
So uh, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Stramko. This has been a really uh, a great session on a super important topic. And uh, just a reminder of the Canadian Frailty Network's AVOID acronym uh, to help lower the risk uh, activity, stay physically active, uh, vaccinate, uh, not just against COVID-19, but against uh, other illnesses like influenza and pneumonia, uh, optimize medications uh, so that you're not on too many and the side effects aren't interfering, uh, interact, try to maintain physical uh, connections with people safely, socially uh, engaged, cognitively engaged with social activities, so important. Um, and then finally, diet and nutrition. And I think you had some excellent suggestions there around ways of enhancing kind of high protein in some cases, but basically healthy nutrition to maintain the caloric intake required to avoid uh, frailty and weakness. Um, just a reminder, we wouldn't, it, none of this would be possible without the support from the Center for Aging and Brain Health Innovation powered by Baycrest, uh, the Jarris Center at Hamilton Health Sciences, uh, centered at St. Peter's where uh, Dr. Stramko is coming to us uh, from today, McMaster University, the Hamilton Hem Health Sciences Foundation, the Alzheimer's Society Foundation of ha Hamilton Halton, and our uh, division of e-learning team uh, still working safely and remotely. Uh, a reminder that there is a donate button in the top right of our igericare.ca site. Please don't be afraid to use it. And our next live event is scheduled at the uh, towards the end of May. Um, and uh, we have a survey that is pinned at the top of the comments section. If you're accessing via Facebook, you can always email us if you have any suggestions. And uh, please feel free to fill out the survey and help uh, predict future live event topics. So as always, uh, my thank you to Dr. Stramko. Um, teamwork makes the dream work and stay safe, everybody. We'll see you next time. All right. Thanks, Anthony.